One uh, distinct advantage which the Welsh language has over English is that it is, uh, on the whole, uh, phonetic, which means that uh, if you know how the letters are supposed to sound, you just have to say uh, what you see. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It's certainly a lot simpler than English, because English is not like that, and therefore you cannot be sure that a particular character is pronounced the same way on every occasion, and uh, the fact that I've just said sure rather than sure uh, demonstrates that. It also means that words with different spellings can sometimes sound the same. For example, up until fairly recently, I was sure that the word fishing began with the letter F. I'm sure I've seen signs on the sides of lakes and rivers, no fishing, as in F-I-S-H-I-N-G. But over the last few years, I've started to see warnings on my computer about the dangers of fishing. But this time, beginning with PH, sounds the same, but spelt differently. And not only is it spelt differently, it means something completely different. If you see a warning on your computer about the dangers of fishing, it's not referring to the risk of getting your feet wet or the danger of falling into the river. Instead, it's referring to the threat of someone getting your personal information over the internet by presenting themselves as a honest and reliable visitor. On most occasions it will be obvious, but on other occasions there is the very real danger of being deceived, of being conned. And although fishing, spelt with a PH, is a relatively new word, the concept behind it has been around for a very long time. Which leads me to my first point, and that is from verse 1 through the middle of verse 3, and there we see the danger of being deceived. The danger of being deceived. Now, if you've been with us over recent weeks, then you'll know that the future return of Jesus Christ is a prominent theme within Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Uh, so, for example, in chapter 1, verse 10 of his first letter to them, he indicates that a vital aspect of their conversion experience was that they had turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. That is true biblical Christianity. And that is why when he comes to write his second letter to them, the subject crops up again. As we discovered a few weeks ago, Paul's way of encouraging them in the midst of severe persecution is to remind them that Jesus is coming again. <laughs> and that on his return, chapter 1, verse 6, he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled. The future return of Jesus Christ is a means of reassuring them and reassuring us that God is just and therefore our suffering in this world will not continue forever. And now that we have reached chapter 2, <laughs> far from dropping the subject of Jesus' return and moving on to something else, Paul sticks with it, and he says this, verse 1. He says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us. It appears that there has been some form of communication circulated amongst the Thessalonian Christians which claimed to have come from Paul. It was apparently sent from his email address, to put it in modern jargon. It had his name at the bottom of the letter. 
but it had nothing whatsoever to do with him. And so if you think scams are a new thing, if you think fishing with a PH is a new thing, then please note, such things have been around for years. And on that occasion back then, it had the potential to cause those Christians enormous problems because that false communication said that the very event which the Thessalonians were longing for and looking forward to had already happened. And that was the return of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the effect of such a lie upon these relatively young Christians? Imagine that you are lying, lost and injured up in the mountains. You have managed to raise the alarm and you've been assured that the helicopter is on his way to get you. And so you're waiting for the helicopter to come and rescue you. You're patiently and eagerly waiting, knowing that the arrival of the helicopter is your one and only means of rescue before darkness falls and before the temperature plummets for the night. You're waiting and waiting. And then eventually you hear the noise of the rotor blades. Whew. Only to discover that the helicopter flies straight over you and leaves you stranded. Your only hope of rescue has passed you by and has left you to face the frightening consequences. What a feeling of despair. What a feeling of disappointment that would cause you. And that's precisely the effect which this false communication could have had on these young Christians. They've been waiting for Jesus. <laughs> the Jesus who not only will pour an end to persecution, however great news that is, but more importantly still, the Jesus who will deliver us from the coming wrath, as 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10 tells us. They've been waiting on this Jesus. Only to hear that he has already come and his coming has passed them by. Whereas 1 Thessalonians was written to reassure those who were concerned that dead Christians might miss out on the return of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians was written to reassure living Christians who were beginning to think they had missed out on the return of Jesus Christ. That's how serious this was. And that is why Paul tells them in verse 2 not to become unsettled or alarmed by such teaching. That is why he warns them in verse 3, do not let anyone deceive you in that way. That is the danger of being deceived. And it's a danger which particularly exists when people like those people back then claim to have a word from God. You see, <laughs> the reason why they claimed Pauline authorship, why did they do that? Was it because they thought if Paul's name's on the front cover of the book, it will sell more copies? No. The reason why they claim Pauline authorship for their lie was because they wanted to claim apostolic authority. That's the reason. These young churches recognized the apostles as having a unique God-given role to speak with a unique God-given authority. And therefore, if the perpetrators of this lie could claim that Paul was the author of it, then they could claim such an authority. They could claim that they were speaking with God's authority. And even if the particular lie they were perpetrating back then may not be quite so popular today, the problem st 
still exist today. How many times throughout history has someone stood up and spoken up and said, God has told me. God has told me that the world is going to end on such and such a date. And people have believed it. And sadly, some Christians have believed it. How many times has someone said, God has told me that you should do this or do that? How many times has someone said, God has told me that you're going to be healed of your illness? And people believe such claims only to be left discouraged and disillusioned and perhaps even devastated when those claims prove to be false. That is the danger of being deceived. And it's to prevent it from happening that Paul not only warns them about it in verses 1 to 3, but he also provides them with the necessary protection in verse 15. If you look ahead to verse 15, he provides them with a solution to the problem. He provides them with the necessary protection when he says, Stand firm and hold to the teachings that we, i.e. the apostles, passed on to you. That is the solution. <laughs> that is the protection in the face of such a threat. Hold on to the teachings that we passed on to you. And what that means for you and I 2,000 years later is that rather than being taken in and being led astray by all sorts of people claiming to communicate a new word from God, as those con men were doing back then, rather than being led astray by such people, let us stick to the word that God has already given us through his apostles. Hold on, hold fast to the teaching, says Paul that we passed on to you. And just as that was the necessary protection in the face of the threat back then, so it continues to be the necessary protection in the face of that continuing threat today. That is the danger of being deceived. Secondly, from the middle of verse 3 through to, the, uh, through to verse 8, and there we see the comfort of knowing God is in control. The comfort of knowing that God is in control. Now, as you read through the New Testament, you discover that both Jesus and the apostles taught about the need to be ready for the future return of Jesus Christ. For example, in Matthew 24, verse 42, we hear Jesus saying, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Verse 44, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Earlier in that chapter, verse 36, Jesus said, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Did you hear that? <laughs> no one knows when that day will be. And that has two huge implications. Firstly, it means that all predictions concerning the coming of Jesus Christ must be treated as false. Anyone who says he's coming in such and such a year or in such and such a date is telling a lie because they have no right to say that, because Jesus has made it clear they don't know that. But then secondly, the other implication is that it means that because no one knows when that day will be, it means that people in every generation must be ready and prepared for his coming. The first century Christians that Paul wrote to were right 
to be waiting for his son from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. Such waiting and such preparedness was not naivety on the part of those first century Christians. And we know that because when you get to Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, you hear Paul endorsing and encouraging such waiting. Even the great apostle says, we eagerly await a saviour from there, i.e. from heaven. That is an eager awaiting that the Christian church in every, in every generation should demonstrate. And of all the things that the church in this generation could learn from its first century predecessors, then this is surely one of them. One of our great weaknesses today is that we have become so comfortable and so content with our lives in this present world that we are not eagerly awaiting our Saviour to return from heaven as we should be. But then, what Jesus and his apostles also taught on the subject was that prior to his coming, certain other things would happen. And that is why the Thessalonians can be reassured that the coming of Christ has not already occurred and has not passed them by. Did you notice what Paul said to them in verse 3? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, if you compare what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and what Paul says here in 2 Thessalonians 2, you will see that there are considerable similarities throughout both chapters. Both point forward to a time of unparalleled rebellion against the authority of God. And here in 2 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that that rebellion will be led by a man of lawlessness, or as John describes him in chapter 2 of his letter, the Antichrist. Well, as Paul makes clear in verse 7, there has been plenty of lawlessness throughout history. And John refers in his letter to many antichrists appearing throughout history, but both Paul and John indicate that such lawless, rebellious antichrist behavior will come to a climax immediately prior to the return of Jesus Christ and will culminate in the appearing of an individual on the stage of world history who Paul describes as the man of lawlessness. And as you probably know, <laughs> there have been no shortage of suggestions throughout the history of the church as to who this individual might be. Some have suggested that rather than an individual, <laughs> we should be looking for a religious or a political or an economic power system that demonstrates such characteristics. And so Christians have often identified someone or something whom they thought fitted the bill and they rushed to fit them with the title as well, only to discover that it wasn't them. Well, such individuals may have been antichrist in the sense that John uses the word in 1 John chapter 2, but none of them have been the antichrist. And the fact that they have come and gone and we are still here demonstrates that. And therefore, if there is something we can learn from church history on this matter, it is that we should be careful, extremely careful, about leaping from the pages of Scripture into the realm of sheer speculation. We should be extremely careful of that. Better to stick with the information that we are given in our Bibles and be content to have many unanswered questions. It's much better and much safer to do that rather than to go into the realm of speculation. And therefore, if you're wanting yet another suggestion as to who this individual might be this morning, then you're not going to get one, I'm afraid. But what are we told in our Bibles? 
about this one. Well, verse, these verses tell us that this man of lawlessness, he will rebel against authority. He will rebel against God's authority to the extent, verse 4, that he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Now, rather than referring to a literal temple, it is more likely that Paul is using the word temple as a metaphor for the place where God is worshipped. And therefore, Paul is saying that this lawless one will penetrate every area and aspect of society, including the worshipping Christian community, and he will seek to occupy the place of authority and become the subject of worship there as well. He will set himself up as the supreme source of authority and the unrivaled object of worship throughout our world. And although we may see glimpses of such lawless, blasphemous behavior throughout history, including our own day, we see glimpses of that. Paul indicates in verse 6, that the appearance of this one is being restrained until the appointed time for him to be revealed. His appearance is being held back, says Paul, and it has been held back, whatever means God may be using to hold it back, it has been held back ultimately by God, and it is only at God's appointed time that he will be revealed, verse 8, only <laughs> to be overthrown and destroyed by the coming of Jesus Christ. Back in verse 3, Paul described this Antichrist in two ways. Firstly, he was described as the man of lawlessness. And in verse 4, Paul has explained why that is an appropriate title for him. But he's also described in verse 3 as the man doomed to destruction. And now that we have reached verse 8, we see why that is an appropriate title for him. For how long this one will exercise his authority, Paul does not say. But what we do know is that it will be temporary. It will be fleeting. It will be passing. He is ultimately doomed to destruction because, verse 8, the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Isn't that great news this morning? That is the great news of knowing that God is in control. God is in control. Now, if you watch the 10 o'clock news, uh, BBC News, on a Saturday evening, there will come a point when the presenter says something like, if you don't want today's football results, now is the time to leave the room. Because match of the day immediately follows this programme. Some people prefer to watch, well, some people prefer not to watch football at all. I ought to say that. Uh, but some people prefer to watch football knowing the results, whilst others prefer to watch it not knowing the results. I don't know which of those two categories you come into, uh, but the latter, uh, the latter would rather be on the edge of their seats, not knowing what the final score is going to be until the final whistle is blown. Well, that's fine for a game of football, but it can be a lot more nerve-wracking when it comes to world history. You turn on the telly and you hear of a complete breakdown in law and order in some part of the world. The next day, the news is of our own parliament passing laws that are completely contrary to our creator's design and decrees. The next day, you hear of a dictator seizing power in some other country, and even if the news presenter doesn't say so, you know it's going to result in horrendous persecution for the Christians in that place. 
And after a string of news bulletins like that, you may be tempted to think to yourself, where is this all going to end? Where is this all going to end? How many times have you heard people ask that question? How many times have you asked it yourself? Where is this all going to end? Let me just say that if you're not a Christian this morning, then you ought to be asking that question and you ought to be thinking hard and seriously about it. But if you are a Christian, then although you ought to be concerned about such developments in our country and in our world, you don't need to be panicking. And you don't need to be perplexed over such things for the simple reason that you do know how it's going to end. Like the football fan who knows what the score is, you and I as Christian people are watching history unfold. And although we do not have all the answers or the explanations as to why things are as they are, we do know what the final outcome will be. Now that shouldn't make us complacent because these verses in 2 Thessalonians would suggest that there will come a time when the news bulletins get much worse than they are now. Can you imagine what the headlines are going to be when the man of lawlessness starts to flex his muscles and is finally revealed? That's assuming, of course, that the media is not the first thing that he takes control of. But can you imagine? Can you imagine what the headlines are going to be then? It's not going to make for pleasant listening or viewing, especially for those of us who are Christians. But no matter how bad it is, when it finally happens, the Christian can still be assured of the final outcome for the simple reason that they can be assured that God is in control. It is God who restrains such a manifestation of lawlessness in the meantime. It is God who will remove that restraint at his appointed time and he will do so for the very purpose of that lawless, blasphemous one being overthrown and destroyed at the coming of Jesus Christ. That's how it's all going to end. With a victorious, conquering saviour. That's how it's going to end. You can be assured of that. And that is the great comfort of knowing that God is in control. Thirdly, and finally, verses 9 to 12. And there we see the importance of believing the truth. The importance of believing the truth. Now, rather than simply appearing out of nowhere, the lawless one, says Paul, will appear as part of a bigger picture and part of a bigger strategy, and that is the strategy of Satan. He first appeared in Genesis 3, and he has been active in this world ever since. For example, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, uh, we hear Paul saying, we wanted to come to you, but Satan stopped us. Ever since the Garden of Eden, he has been seeking to disrupt the work of God in this world, and the appearance of the lawless one will be his last and greatest attempt to do so. That is why Paul says in verse 8, verse 9 rather, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. 
Now, the word translated as coming at the start of verse 9 is the word parousia. That may be familiar to some of you because that's the same word that is used throughout Scripture for the coming of Jesus. And so just as the climax of God's saving work in this world will be the parousia of Jesus, so the culmination of Satan's opposition to God and his work in this world will be the parousia of the man of lawlessness. The appearing of the lawless one will be Satan's attempt to counterfeit the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for many people, it will be a counterfeit that successfully cons them. They will be impressed. They will be taken in by his power, his supernatural abilities. The result being that many will be deceived. Many on that day will be deceived. But please note who it is that's going to be deceived. It is, verse 10, those who are perishing. And the reason they are perishing is because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. It's having rejected the truth, the truth of God's revealed word. It's having rejected the truth that men and women in their millions will be deceived on that future day. And rather than God helplessly standing by on that day and watching those millions being deceived by Satan's strategy as if this is Satan's great final victory in this world, Rather than God just standing helplessly by with nothing to do or able to do, verse 11 tells us that God will be in control and will be working out his purposes even on that occasion. And you might be thinking to yourself, how could God possibly be working out any purposes in that sort of situation. He will be doing so, says Paul, in that it is he who sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Did you hear that? Those are solemn words. Having previously rejected the truth, God gives them over to suffer the consequences of their preferred and deliberate response to the word of God. Having previously rejected the truth, God gives them over on that day to believe a lie. Please note, if you don't believe the truth, there will come a day when you believe a lie. The lie of Satan, a lie which will find millions of men and women responding to the appeal of the Antichrist, a lie which will lead them to their final and eternal condemnation. That is the danger of refusing to believe the truth. Please note, you can't remain neutral with regards to God's truth. You can't just say, well, I'm going to opt out of that one. There is no neutral ground in relation to God's truth. You either believe it or you reject it. And if you reject it, there will come a day when you believe the lie. That is the danger of refusing to believe the truth. And therefore, the only way to be saved and to be preserved and protect, protected from that danger on that future day is to believe the truth in the here and now. Oh yes, contrary to what our society tells us, there is such a thing as truth. Objective 
truth. And there is the truth that God has revealed in his word. It is on the pages of our Bible that we discover the truth about God. That he is a holy and a righteous and a gracious God. It is on the pages of our Bible that we discover the truth about ourselves. That we have rebelled against our creator and are therefore guilty in his sight. It is on the pages of our Bible that we discover the wonderful truth, the great truth, that guilty and condemned sinners like us can be forgiven and justified and eternally saved through trusting in the person and work of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the truth that God has revealed. And it is only through believing his truth that we can know God's forgiveness in the present. And it is only through believing his truth that we can be assured of his protection and preservation and salvation on that future day when those who have rejected the truth will believe Satan's lie and in doing so will find themselves to be eternally condemned. Do you see the importance of believing the truth? Do you see the importance of believing the truth now? Because as Jesus said, Matthew 24, no one knows when that day is coming. No one knows. And therefore we need to be ready, we need to be prepared for that day now. And these verses, 9 to 11, 9 to 12, they make it clear. That the only way to be prepared and the only way to be assured that you're going to be safe and secure on that day is by believing the truth now. That is the importance of believing the truth. So let me ask you in closing. Have you believed it? Three things that we've learned from 2 Thessalonians 2. Firstly, the danger of being deceived. Secondly, the comfort of knowing God is in control. And uh, thirdly, the importance of believing uh, the truth.